Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 136, Thames River with Caroline Crampton. Yes, we talked a bit about Caroline on the show before because she has this fantastic podcast about women's detective novels called She Done It, which is very, very good. And we mentioned it in the episode, but Caroline is a delight to talk to. And she has so much knowledge about the Thames River that... I only have very passing understanding of the Thames from Shakespeare and whatnot. (laughs) We had such a lovely conversation, and I can't wait to learn more about the Thames in her new book, which we will promote to you, don't worry, in the episode. But um, if you listen to podcasts to go to sleep, get ready, because this episode is chill as fuck. Yeah, it is very calm. I really, really love her voice. It's just chill as hell. And then listen again, because there's great facts and good stories. That's true. You'll listen twice. You know who I would always listen to twice in any like recorded format? (laughs) Our new patrons. Our new patrons, Evangeline, Nicole, Sarah, and Luke. Welcome. You join the distinguished ranks of such patrons as our supporting producers. Philip, Eeyore, Skyla, Mercedes, Samantha, Danica, Marissa, Sammy, Josie, Neil, Jessica, and Phil Fresh. Ah, I love those gang. Such a good gang. Also, so good, uh, uh, unmeasurably good. Have their own like title patterns good. Mm. Ayla, Cody, Mr. Folk, Haley, James, Jess, Sarah, Sandra, Audra, and Jack Marie are legend level patrons. Honestly, legends as legendary as the Thames and as old and ancient. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And Julian, would you tell me what fresh drink you whipped us, not ancient whatsoever, for this episode? Yeah, so I made us a couple of brambles on the side of the pond. I, I'm not entirely sure what Caroline was drinking, but we had brambles over here. So the bramble was actually created in 1984 in London at Fred's Club in Soho. And it's inspired by summers of picking blackberries along the shores of the Thames. So I was like, well, this is just perfect. I can't not Absolutely. use Absolutely amazing and it sounds like a drink that uh that friend of the show and and former guest andrea would love Oof. because creme de cassis is like chef's kiss yes. delicious it's delightful it also has gin and fresh blackberries and it is a really like nice just summer refreshing drink well i really really enjoyed it and um do you have any particular like listening or reading that you would suggest pairing with your cocktail this summer Okay, so I'm I'm rereading the American Hippo series, which I recommended to y'all a couple episodes ago, um, and I already recommended that, so I'm not going to do it again. But I would love for everyone to go and listen to the most recent episode of our sister show, Join the Party, because Amanda GM'd a one shot that involved goats, demons, and the Met Gala. I sure did. It also features our good good friend, the chaotic artistic force of nature that is Lauren Shippen. Oh, Jules, I didn't know you'd recommend that this week. That's very sweet of, of you. Of course. It's, it was very, very good. I just listened to it as we were recording this. I listened to this episode and right before that, joined the party. So oh, I got a well, double feature of Amanda being awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was incredibly fun. Basically, I am like leading a uh, like one hour-ish um, one shot where everybody's a little goat and they just want to party. It and it's good. so fun. It was incredibly fun. I got to like be both Kristen Bell and another guest I'm not going to mention because it was such a good reveal. So I don't know, man, whether or not you like RPGs, I think you'll enjoy me trying to marshal three goats having a party at the Met Gala. So, you know join the party pod.com. It was very funny and very good. And the link is in our description. That is so sweet of you, Julia. Thank you. And speaking of multitude goodness, it would be a very good week for folks to sign up for our mailing list at multitude.productions. And I'm not going to tell you why, but there's there's uh, there's some stuff brewing. There's some good stuff happening. There's, there's new things in the works. And you will be first to know if you sign up for that mailing list at multitude.productions. And as I've said before many, many times, Amanda makes it so pretty. Thank you. I uh, I do my best. But without any further ado, folks, enjoy Spirits Podcast, episode 136, Thames River with Caroline Crampton. We are so excited to have our friend Caroline Crampton on the show today. Caroline is a writer and podcaster, also the creator of the fabulous show She Done It, which we've talked about several times before. So Caroline, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's very exciting to be on. Yay. We're so pleased. 
We love you and your work, but when I saw that you have just published a book about the history of the Thames River in uh, England, I knew that we had to have you on to talk about that good, good river mythology, which we absolutely <laughs> love. Both of us grew up by the sea. We love rivers. We love water. We love a good mythology of a body of water. So we would love to hear from you anything that you feel fit to share about the Thames and rivers generally. Right. Well, it's an enormous subject, I would say, first of all, um, just the Thames mythology, I mean. So my book is partly about that and it's partly about my own family story and how we ended up living sort of in the estuary of the Thames. And it's also about some of the like history and culture that's associated with it as well. And I spent maybe five or six years working on this book. You know, I had other jobs as well, so it wasn't full time, but, you know, five or six years just thinking about the Thames. And I would say I have read maybe 2% of the books that exist wow. about the Thames. Wow. It is just enormous. Like every time I would go to a library and I would like diligently spend my day like going through bibliographies and stuff, I would just come away weighed down by the sheer weight of stuff there is. Um, and there's loads of reasons for that. But one of the main ones is just that London is on the Thames and London is a very old city and it's Britain's capital city. And it's also just a city that people are obsessed with like stories about. And so the Thames is a big, big part of that. And I think on top of that, you've got the fact that like a lot of, you know, big old cities, Paris went through this as well. And, you know, a lot changed for London in the 19th century, particularly with the river as well. You know, they built embankments on it. They completely changed how the sewer system worked. And as a result, lots of the things about the river that had been very accessible to people, not least the fact that um, the Thames has loads of tributary rivers, that flow into it both above London and all the way through the city. And loads of them just disappeared. They got put into tunnels underground or covered over or used in sewers instead of being out there on the surface. And so, yeah, ever since then, basically, people have just been obsessed with where did the rivers go and where are they now and stuff like that. Um, I love that. So, yeah, so as a result, I, in the process of doing this book, I really just came away with a sense of everything I didn't know rather than everything I did. Mm -hmm. But I did still write an entire book about it. So I have something <laughs> You've to You've added say. to the collection of how many yeah. books there are about the Thames. <laughs> well, it's it's crazy. Like I did an event the other night at the British Library that was about more waterways more generally. There was someone else there talking about other rivers and stuff. And in the questions that section, a really nice person put their hand up saying like, I'm American, like I really don't know much about, you know, Britain's natural world, but I'm really interested in what you said about the Thames and I'd love to know more about it. What would you recommend I read? And I would say, oh, like, so many things. So many things. Um, can I email you? <laughs> yeah. It's the so, best answer for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think that um, Americans or non Brits more generally don't understand about the way that the Thames figures into like the national imagination or the national mythology? So I think a big thing that even people who just haven't ever lived near it wouldn't necessarily know is that the Thames is really tidal. So the whole river is 215 miles long from source to sea and about 100 miles of that is tidal. So every single day the tide comes all the way in from the sea, twice a day, uh, all the way through London and it's been sort of artificially limited now. They built a big lock at a place called Teddington which is in West London. So that's as far as the tide can go now. But that's a huge movement of water in and out every day on top of just the natural, you know, flowing of a river towards the sea yeah. and as a result the Thames is quite fast quite dangerous and it has a really big range I think at the sort of bit in the lunar cycle at the the highest point of the month I think there can be up to five or six meters difference between high and low water so that's oh, wow. like within 12 hours that changes that so I think a lot <laughs> that's something that people so I grew up in the Thames estuary my parents are massive boat people and we did lots of sailing and so on. That's actually how my parents ended up in the Thames Estuary in the first place. They are from South Africa. They built a boat. They sailed it to England. Um, that is so cool. Wow. I knew all this about the tides because it's very important when you're sailing, yeah. especially because there's a lot of sandbanks and mudflats and scary navigational hazards in the sort of part where the river blends into the sea. So you really have to know how much water have I got under the boat at any given time. Mm. But I found it interesting when I moved to London after university and, you know, I would walk across the bridge on my way to work and I'd be like, aha, 
the tide is low now. And I might hmm. comment if, you know, if it was particularly low or something, I might comment to someone I was with and they'd be like, you what? What <laughs> What would he mean? And I, I gradually came to realise that this thing about the river being so incredibly tidal was not necessarily that well known. Yeah. Wow, that's so that's so interesting. And I like that we kind of take things for granted too when we live by them for so long. Like it doesn't personally affect us, but we kind of ignore it because of that. Yeah, right. Or it just kind of falls into the background. Yeah, and that's something else in more generally that I found when I was sort of reading about the Thames and as well as doing loads of book research. I was trying to talk to people and interview people and, and so on. And I found that even people who live by the river their whole lives will tend not to see it in that way that you don't Mm -hmm. see something that you're so familiar with. Uh, And I I found a really interesting study about this that was done back in the 70s, where I think he was an architectural psychologist. Fascinating job. Uh, What a cool job! Right, yeah. (laughs) Cool. uh, His name is David Cantor. And he wanted to sort of dig into this phenomenon of how you don't see the thing that is there every day. And he asked participants in the survey to estimate the distance between two points north and south of the river and then also to do this elsewhere in London so just say like how far roughly do you think it is from Kensington to Hampstead that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and he found that the distances that went across the river people would massively overestimate them compared to the ones that were just on the same side Uh, which is really interesting because it suggests that people think of the river as a much bigger barrier than it is yeah yeah some psychological effect. That's so interesting. And then the second part of his study was that he had a group of people who were new to London, like people who just moved there, um, I think mostly from other countries as well. So they didn't have much residual familiarity. And he asked them, he checked in with them like once a week for six weeks or something and asked them to draw the shape of the Thames. And to start with, it was just a line because people do tend to think of the Thames in London as running right. west east in a sort mm-hmm. of you know flat way. Of course, it doesn't at all. Um, and then gradually, it's really interesting in the book he wrote about this. You can see he includes loads of the drawings, and you can see as that how their drawings develop over the weeks, and they start including some of the squiggles. And then by the end, they actually have a decent approximation of what it's like but they've gone from flat line to all of the squiggly meanders that actually exist yeah i mean i guess when you think of it as being like north bank or south bank you think of the river as just a delineation and Mm -hmm. so the fact that it has like so many hairpin turns and looks like a coiled up stake um you know doesn't necessarily become part of your imagination until you start looking for those lines. I feel that same way about, you know, we're from New York City and people have no idea the relative size of the boroughs, no idea even that like Brooklyn and Queens are on the same landmass or that Staten Island is like fucking gigantic. Um, Or even that when you look at Manhattan, like the skyline is not, it's not just straight. Like the island is not a straight peninsula. Mm -hmm. There is like a huge portion that kind of curves out at the end, almost like a heart, how a heart is like lopsided. That's sort of what the bottom looks like. So you can be on a different shore or at one point of the shoreline and look up and down and like not see the Empire State Building where you think it's going to be because you're actually looking like way east instead of north the way that Mm -hmm. you think you are. Exactly. Yeah. And I do think that people tend to use the Thames as a like a horizontal axis in their understanding of the city when it's anything but. Um, Mm. And the other thing that I got told when I first moved to London, which was 2009, was that this... (laughs) what people call like the cab driver's immortal refrain uh (laughs) don't go south of the river this time of the night love um (laughs) and there is just this feeling that like north the north bank of the thames is where by and large most of the important buildings are uh it's where all of the important civic things are it's where all of the entertainment is it's just the more expensive side of the river and it's also where the vast majority of the london underground network is if you live in south london you don't take the underground most of the time. You take buses or you take overground trains. And it's much better now, I think, because of competition from stuff like Uber and whatever. Mm -hmm. Black cab drivers have had to start going south of the river. But there's just this sense that, you know, once you cross the Thames, it's so much harder to get anywhere and it's that much less approachable. And I think that's another reason why it's quite a big barrier in the mind of Londoners. I definitely remember really early 
when I first moved to London, I'd come back from somewhere uh, out of the city really late and I got off at the mainline train terminal and I was in the queue because, oh, also, if you don't, if you haven't been to London, you might not know, like our trains don't run after about midnight. Um, so if you get back after that time, you you just have to walk or pay for cabs. And Which is really good context because that's why the night bus with a K in Harry Potter mm-hmm. is a pun because in London, if you're you know out drinking at one in the morning, there's no more trains to take a night bus with an N. So it's like extremely Glad funny. you got our Harry Potter reference <laughs> in early. Yeah. And I didn't know that when I read Harry Potter, I didn't realize that people wouldn't know that. And also, yeah. if you've never taken a night bus or like, they are wild. It is. They are. It's completely. It's like a. It's like a. Uh, like one of those Hummer, like party Hummer limos in a way, yeah. or it's just like like weird collections of people who you would never expect to see in the same spot. I I, I, I love them a lot. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for explaining this to me because I haven't been there yet. There's a. Um. I would definitely say if um if people are interested, there's an amazing episode of the Nocturne podcast about this that um Helen Zaltzman, a famous podcaster and British friend of mine um she did an, an episode of that I think it's called the bubble which is about an incident in a night bus where it turned really dark like someone got stabbed on the upper deck oh, no. of the night bus and she she basically just talks about how although that's horrible it's sort of it feels possible all the time when you're on a night bus that everything Oof. could just turn upside down like that yeah well, here is your uh, your American introduction to, uh, or introduction for Americans to the the British vocabulary. Also, didn't know that treacle tart was real. I thought it was like, or like like a pumpkin pasty or pumpkin juice for that matter. I thought they were all like fictional wizard treats. Um, oh, yes, the so. wizard treats. <laughs> fictional <laughs> wizard treats. That's amazing. My husband loves treacle tart. He makes it all the time. It's delicious. I tried it when I when I lived in London, and I was like, I was just like grinning to myself and looking around like someone was playing a prank on me. It was adorable. <laughs> You're like, oh, is this cafe Harry Potter inspired? And they're like, no, eat it your is pie. to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, right, yeah. So uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I remember once coming back from somewhere out of town and having to get a taxi and being in the queue for the cab rank of Victoria Station, and I needed to go somewhere on the north bank, so I was fine. But there was someone in front of me who was qu- he was quite drunk and he was trying to get a cab to take him to Croydon. And Croydon is like really far south London, like arguably not really even in London at all. Some people might say, but it is, you know, in the larger London area and just no cab drivers would take him there. And he was literally like showing them his money in some cases to be like, look, I can totally pay for this. I'm not trying to rip right. you off. I just really need to go to this place and it's really late. And they were like, no, sorry. Um, and that always stuck with me is an idea that just the river is still this, even in the you know, contemporary age, it's still this barrier for people. Yeah. Oh, that's so that's so fascinating too, because like I, I'm thinking from like a mythological standpoint, there are so many like delineations between like the world of the living and the world of the dead and the underworld versus you know the mortal plane and this like feels very much like that in a lot of ways where Mm. you know it's it's crossable but it takes a lot of effort to cross it yeah that guy should have paid double cab fare much like going to the river sticks you have to have two coins Mm -hmm. one to go there one to come back back. yeah so actually you mentioned the river sticks and that's a really big thing I found in images of London and the way people think about it is this idea that it represents death or um, or something that has to be appeased. So uh, I read all of these archaeological books and there's actually a really good book called Thames colon Sacred River, which covers this in lots of de- detail. But basically for over a thousand years, more like two, three even, the archaeological record shows that people have just been throwing things in the river to I a- love it. appease it. So yes, love it. they found everything from, you know, astonishing artifacts like the these fishermen fished out a cup of Trojan origin um, near Hammersmith Bridge that is oh estimated God. to be made That's between cool. 1000 and 700 uh, years BC. You know, really incredible stuff like that. But then also just um, weapons like Bronze Age weapons and Neolithic flint axes and animal bones and human bones. And more recently, sort of medieval times, uh, these pilgrim tokens. I know. Sorry. Yeah, I'm 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 just so used to (laughs) uh, more recently, like 100 years ago. And you're like, oh, yes, the Middle Ages. I'm like, (laughs) okay, small sidebar. This is something I always get wrong when I talk to Americans because um, 
not that you know we wander around in Britain like steeped in history all the time, but I do think there's a slight different like range we talk about stuff. So like when I tell people that the uh, university I went to, my third year dorm room was in a, a building that had basically been the same since 1264. Um, people are like, wow, was it a castle? It's like, no, it was just a building. Um, <laughs> it's just been there forever. Yeah. So <laughs> Eddie Izzard has a great bit on that where it's just like, ah, oh, yes, we unearthed this from 60 years ago. And it's like, mm, that's the American <laughs> vibe. I gotcha. That is what it's like in California, especially though. You walk somewhere, they're like, yes, this historic building built in 1962. <laughs> and I'm like, my my dad was around then. Like, it's not, what? <laughs> my dad was alive. <laughs> that's not acceptable. It's the same. My, my parents um, are really into this as an idea because they come from South Africa a place like America that doesn't have like a ton of stuff pre like the 17th century. Um, Like my dad's sister lives in a very old part of Cape Town Mm. in that it was one of the first areas to be settled by the Dutch when they arrived. But there are houses in England that are that old that aren't listed, that aren't protected by the government, you know? Um, So yeah, it's just an interesting like perspective on that kind of thing mm-hmm. um sorry to be to sidetracked us with my no it's surprise. I, I, I always find that fascinating like my parents are sailing in uh sort of well they're, they've just crossed over into canada now i think they're like in the lakes um nice. and this is something that my mom talks about all the time when i talk to her she's like yeah i was really excited to go to this place because the guidebook i have said it was like a historic town and then it was just <laughs> all normal um, from <laughs> sometimes <laughs> Yeah, she's uh-uh. got to recalibrate her tourism. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, sorry, I was talking about the the pilgrim tokens. Um, right. When people were kind of going to Canterbury on the famous Chaucer-esque pilgrimage to see the Shrine of Thomas a Becket, um, they would have one of the many things the church would try and sell you uh, to, as a memorial or a souvenir of your pilgrimage were these sort of like round, big, flat coins with the details of your journey stamped on it. And people used to throw them in the river as, I don't know, I think partly like a kind of wishing well type thing, mm-hmm. but also as yeah. a, you know, the river is holy and, and so I'm dedicating my pilgrimage by doing this. Um, oh, see, my thought was like proof that you'd been there. Like, hey, see God, I did it. Boop. Yeah, maybe. And then you just kind of like put it in the in the collection jar. Also, uh, here's, a, here's a thesis for you. I think that uh, pilgrim tokens are the first like instagram geotag it's like yes i really am in amsterdam suck it <laughs> yeah oh my God. I, I definitely think there's something in that and you know you can even um because i went to school near canterbury like taking us to the cathedral and the associated ridiculous chaucer based museum was a like annual thing and in in the stupid canterbury tales experience there's a there used to be i don't know if there still is there used to be one of those machines you know where you can like put a penny in and it yeah it grinds it and it stretches and it stamps it with mm-hmm. a design they say is taken from one of the original pilgrim groats or something which i i w- used to do every single time we went even though <laughs> it's really dumb but um uh, but yeah what's interesting about the thames and religion though is because you've probably heard of this figure called old father thames um uh, this sort of odd non-denominational deity that nobody really knows as far as I can tell knows no one can really trace it back to any one single source mm. but there are representations of him from you know going back hundreds of years and he's you know he's like a guy with a long flowing beard often depicted in reliefs on bridges and stuff just like right with his face and his like and there used to be a statue of him at the source of the Thames that's now been moved slightly further down to a place called Lechlade. Um I think he looks a bit like Neptune and there are some mm. statues that where he has a trident as mm. well and he's just generally the embodiment of the river and in a kind of pagan sense it doesn't I can't I can't find any evidence that it's really connected to Christianity or anything like that it's just this is the river's god um and i really liked i found there's a there's a poem from the 17th century by a poet called john denham called cooper's hill and in it he says thames the most loved of all the ocean sons and Mm -hmm. quite like that as an idea that like each river would have his own god and they were all junior to the ocean (laughs) um so have you read the rivers of london series by ben aronovich 
I haven't. Um, loads and loads of people have recommended this to me. Not, I'm sure. Not least when I did the Thames episode of She Done It and I talked about detective stories that are set on the Thames. Um, so many listeners were like, you have to read this. Um, but no, I haven't got around to it yet, but I really want to. Maybe when I go on holiday this year, that would be a good... Yeah, well, you're not required. And probably <laughs> you know all of the bits that were new to me through these through the series. But they have a lot of um, like literal daughters of the river, like river goddesses mm-hmm. that each have their own estuary based off of like the, the main Thames. Like, so it's sort of like mother-daughter type situation. Um, and it, it deals really interestingly, in my opinion, with the like bricking over and making underground of so many of the rivers that used to just like wind through the countryside. Mm. Um, so uh, Conspirators recommended that book to me. And I... I think it's lovely. So that sounds try interesting. It out. I got to pick that up. Yeah, it sounds really, really good. Um, it's also, uh, I like slightly know Ben Aronovich because he used to be a journalist at the Times um, way back when I first started being a journalist. And he has this whole other career as like serious writer of spy nonfiction. <laughs> really? Yeah. So he's, I think, best known in Britain for that kind of stuff. You know, he writes like the real life shot John Le Carre type nonfiction about you know i didn't know that was a thing but that makes complete sense yeah it's a massive genre here like it's really popular you can read all kinds of stuff into it but there were you know there were these (laughs) famous four i think they were they were called the cambridge four or something famous four cambridge graduates who like in the 60s secretly defected to russia and then became big at mi5 and then eventually got found out and you know he's written books about that kind of thing so he, mm. I see his name all the time because there are big posters at stations and stuff advertising That's these so books. funny. <laughs> and I really didn't know until quite recently that he had this whole other series. That he wrote like sexy fiction about mm-hmm. water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the so sexiest funny. fiction about water. Oh, a little sexy. A little sexy. <laughs> <laughs> oh no i'm glad it's sexy i i think that's definitely a like underrepresented thing about the thames as well that it does have a kind of fertility dimension that's true. to it as well that i think partly because of the huge tidal range and stuff um mm-hmm. writers going back centuries have really enjoyed comparing it to the nile um yeah and there's a whole sadly re like totally apocryphal and based on a typo theory but enjoyable nonetheless that so the latin name for thames is tamesis um Mm -hmm. t-a-m-e-s-i-s and for a very long time like up until like the 19th maybe even early 20th century there was general agreement that the thames was the name for the river below oxford from the source to oxford it was called the isis which obviously has Egyptian connotations and all Mm -hmm. of that Um, and there's a tributary river called the Tame so T-H-A-M-E that joins the river just after Oxford so basically Mm -hmm. they were saying Isis plus Tame equals (laughs) Tamasis and that's the name (laughs) for the Thames Um, and I think lots of sort of Victorian writers enjoyed attributing this to kind of medieval monks and stuff but there is no evidence for it whatsoever Mm -hmm. That was an extremely adorable, like, OTP portmanteau name. Yeah. (laughs) It's just that it just happens that the Latin includes the cis suffix. Mm -hmm. That's that's it, really. It's just how it would (laughs) be. Yeah. But um, it is true, though, that the Isis is still what people in Oxford call the river. Um, That's where I went to university. And there's, you know, people just say, like, are you rowing on the Isis tomorrow? Like, it's just what you call it. And also, it's a really popular brand name in and around Oxford there's Mm. even there was a a famous cheese shop in central Oxford that had an Isis cheese and you know I mean listen I would buy it and I can't even eat cheese like I get it (laughs) yeah you're you're (laughs) speaking my language though because I will sign up for any kind of mythology inspired cheese Mm -hmm. (laughs) well I can't wait to find out more but first Jules let's go grab a refill let's go Julia, we are sponsored this week by HoneyBook. Now, you know as well as I do that the beginning of the month means all kinds of like annoying things that you don't necessarily want to do. Got to send those invoices. Got to reconcile the old invoices that are just now getting paid a little bit late. Got to pay your staff. You got to keep track of your hours. And there's lots and lots of things that spreadsheet loving creatures such as myself might not mind. But the thing is, when you have a business and it's growing and growing, it's super exciting. But also that means that the work gets more and more and more. And you have to put more and more time into the like administrative side of running a business and less in the stuff that you 
actually want to be doing. So that's why I'm so glad that I have HoneyBook on my side. HoneyBook is a business management platform that is designed for solo people, for small business owners alike. It can handle client communications, bookings, contracts, invoices all in one place. And it's wonderful when I have one fewer spreadsheet to cross-reference to another spreadsheet. It's nice to not have to go to three different websites to send three different contracts. It sure is. And it even integrates with QuickBooks, Google Suite, Excel, MailChimp, and Gmail, all the ways that you already talk to your clients. So trust me, if you have a small business, you're going to want to check out HoneyBook. And they're offering our listeners 50% off your first year with the promo code SPIRITS. That applies to both the monthly and the annual plans, by the way. So go to HoneyBook.com and use promo code SPIRITS for 50% off your first year. HoneyBook.com, promo code SPIRITS. Amanda, I have boobs, and they're my boobs. They're very... They're very unique to me. And there so are other boobs like them, but these ones are yours. Yes, that is true. And so I needed a bra that was unique and fit to my body. So thank God I got a third love bra. Whoa, how's your third love working out? I am wearing my everyday lace t-shirt bra extremely almost every day. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I'm wearing my racerback one right now and it is so comfy. So the thing is, Third Love offers more than 70 sizes, including their signature half cups. I'm a half cup. I never knew that but I am. It's very interesting. So the best part about it is they have a fit finder quiz. So you answer a few simple questions and then you find your perfect fit within 60 seconds. So it's actually fun to take. It takes less than a minute to complete. And by the end of it, you have you have a bra that fits your breast size and the shape, and it's a style that fits your body. Yeah, I love it. You can tell them if your cups are too tight, if they runneth over, if your straps sag, or if they cut in. There are so many variables that their love just gets really, really right. Yeah. And honestly, they're really comfortable. Their quality is really good. I'm someone who hates tags on bras specifically. It really, really bothers me. But Third Love, they're always tagless labels. They don't slip down. The straps never slip. They're very grippy, which is great because I hate readjusting my straps and stuff like that. So they know that there is a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering our listeners 15% off your first order. So go to thirdlove.com slash spirits now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. Again, that's thirdlove.com slash spirits for 15% off today. And Jules, I'm still getting to know this wonderful neighborhood of Greenpoint, Brooklyn, where the Multitudio is located. And I made a wonderful discovery last week, which is that there is a sushi place nearby that does a like teriyaki fried tofu <gasps> bento box for lunch. Oof. I'm so sorry you weren't there the day that we ordered these because it was so good. And you want to know how we got those delivered to our door so we did not have to leave our air conditioning and go forth and find lunch? DoorDash. It sure was. It genuinely was. It was extremely easy. The DoorDash folks who do the delivery always know how to get into the building. Like they read the delivery notes and they know important. this like weird door system that we have, which is really lovely because the last thing I want is to have to like be on the phone for 15 minutes and go outside and try to locate my food. So DoorDash is super easy. It has an app where you can choose what you want to eat and then the Dasher will bring it right to you wherever you are. Yeah, you can also, even if you're not in the mood for the sweet corner sushi place that has that teriyaki tofu, oh my God, now I'm so hungry. <laughs> you can go to stuff like your favorite chains, like they have Chipotle or Wendy's or the Cheesecake Factory, which is Amanda's favorite chain restaurant of all time. What a dream. What a dream. And you can even get $5 off your first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code SPIRITS. Yep, that's $5 off your first order when you download the DoorDash app from the App Store and enter the promo code SPIRITS. Exactly. When you're ready to check out, just put that promo code SPIRITS in for $5 off your first order from DoorDash. And now let's get back to the show. Um, but yeah, there's just loads of stuff called ISIS. Like it's just a, you know, you would, I don't know if this is real, but I feel like you could stand on Oxford High Street and a, a van would go past being like, ISIS plumbing, fix your toilet now. That It's just, it's just <laughs> a name for stuff. Um, <laughs> but it does have that nice, that nice mythological association that I think people enjoy. And I found it in all kinds of places. So like um, JMW Turner, uh, the painter, he was a big fan of painting the Thames at all points on the river. And But his paintings and his drawings of the upper Thames, he really liked making it look, for want of a word, like neoclassical. So he used mm. to add temples and stuff that aren't there. And then he titled. Oh the my page. gosh, how baffling! I know for architects so cool. or for archaeologists being like, "Wait, what? Huh? Where'd it go?" <laughs> and then he'd he'd call the page. So there's a, I think there's a painting called like the Isis at Weybridge, and it's got a kind of, you know, portico with columns and stuff in it that just isn't there. Um, 
so yeah, I think people have always been kind of obsessed with the idea that if you, it, its name is Isis and it has sort of classical links, even though it doesn't really. <laughs> yeah, like are there other ways that um, that people throughout history in Britain have sort of linked or tried to use the Thames in a like historical continuity? Because there's obviously, you know, Roman roots. There's a lot of like classical studies with the big C. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how the river sort of like maps onto a, a self-understanding or like a historical understanding? So yeah, that's de- definitely a big thing. And I'd say one of the the biggest associations is with a kind of, for want of a better word, like nationhood, a feeling of nationhood, because uh, the Magna Carta, uh, this very important but confusing document from the 13th, 13th century, I want to say 13th century, was signed on the banks of the Thames at a place called Runnymede, just on the western edge of London. Uh, and it was signed, some people say, on an actual river, uh, on an actual island in the river that's now called Magna Carta Island. There's no evidence <laughs> for that. I think the Victorians just liked the idea of it. And mm. the Magna Carta... Uh, yes, surrounded by rushing water on all yeah. sides. <laughs> yeah. They built they, they built a little Gothic cottage on Magna Carta Cute. Island oh, to so commemorate good. the uh, a great event. Anyway, the Magna Carta was this uh, the end of this dispute between the then King John and what you when you learn this at school, what they call the unruly barons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why they are specifically unruly, I don't know, but they are just always called because um, the they wanted barons. stuff. They just uh, want to fight. <laughs> well, so they, you know, they wanted various checks and balances on the power of the monarch, and they wanted rules about raising armies and taxation, and basically they wanted an end to absolute absolute monarchy just Um, unruly carol how dare thee i always thought unruly was such a weird word for that because (laughs) that's a very serious political concern and campaign rather than you know oh just a bit out of order anyway it's like a bunch of toddlers that want a second popsicle like that's the that's the association that comes to mind for me (laughs) so there'd been this sort of civil war raging and the I think the king had, I think it's right, yeah, the king had holed up at Windsor Castle, also on the River Thames, and the barons had taken control of the city of London uh, and the fortress of the Tower of London. And there was this kind of stalemate where they each had a important strategic stronghold on the River Thames, but they didn't, they couldn't really, you know, go any further. And then, you know, a lot of stuff happens, but then a kind of peace accord is agreed and King John reluctantly agrees to these various rules and these various um, things that will curtail his power. And they meet at this midpoint between Windsor and Tower, uh, the Tower of London on the River Thames to sign the Magna Carta, which is just this great list of all the things that he won't do anymore. I mean, historians, it's a big subject, obviously, for historians this period, but historians say that a lot of the Magna Carta was contradictory and completely unenforceable and didn't really make a huge amount of sense and didn't necessarily really change stuff that quickly but Mm -hmm. every time in british history since anyone has had a kind of revolutionary movement or any sort of pro-democratic movement they've always looked back to the magna carta as the kind of well we're just trying to do that Mm -hmm. so you know the fact that the chartists in the 18th and 19th century who were you know in favor of universal suffrage and all that kind of stuff they called themselves the Chartists because mm. of the link to the Magna Carta. And then even more recently, when uh, the Thatcherite redevelopment of the former dock areas on the Thames got really aggressively capitalist and the people who actually lived and worked in those areas wanted to object, they called themselves the New Chartists um, mm. and delivered a petition that they made look like the Magna Carta by boat <laughs> to the parliament at Westminster. Oh, that's very good. So the river is really central to those ideas of sort of liberty versus authoritarianism. Um, it also helps, of course, that the Palace of Westminster, which is where both houses of the British Parliament meet, is right on the river and is actually built on reclaimed land on the north bank of the river. Um, mm. There used to be an, a huge sort of medieval palace there, which mostly burned down, apart from the Westminster Hall, which is still very old. And then in the 19th century, they built the building that you know um, from photographs. They built that on a kind of reclaimed island next to it. Um, it's completely falling down. And 
our oh, good. MPs won't fix it. So, yay. God. Um, government. But there seems to be some kind of appeal. Like, you you know, you, you plunk down the seat of government in the literal river. It feels like, I don't know if it was intentional to, to be this way, but it feels like a sort of appeal to some kind of, like, if not divine, then, you know, like geographic source of authority. Mm, definitely. And, uh, you know, other really important state buildings are on the river as well, like various royal palaces. Um, there's uh, the MI5 and MI6, like the big intelligence agencies are both on the river on opposite sides, uh, you know, in, you know, huge modern buildings, but they were built by the river for mm-hmm. a reason. So, yeah, there's definitely this idea that the Thames conveys authority and a uh, a certain sort of political power um and but it's so funny that because the fortunes of the land by the thames has really seesawed over the centuries Mm -hmm. uh you know Mm -hmm. they would build royal palaces by it but also dreadful dreadful slums were right by it so for a long time as someone i met an event the other day said you couldn't have paid people to live by the thames it was seen as you know really for lower class poor people but now, uh, you know, all these huge glass tower blocks that are going up by the river, it's incredibly valuable and not just valuable for people who want to live there, but they have a huge problem in London with people, uh, especially people in you know, Malaysia and China and people who are never planning on ever coming to London, buying London property as an investment and then keeping it empty because it goes up in price enough without ever having to actually install tenants. So essentially buying boxed in air by the Thames makes mm. you money, which is wild <laughs> when you talk to the people who, you know, have lived by the Thames their whole life and they remember when, yeah, you just you couldn't have paid rich people to come anywhere near it. New York That's has so that problem too, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Got that housing problem. They want to mm. tax those uh, like non-occupancy. The empty, yeah, yeah. Like empty penthouse is what they call it, which is very mm. catchy. We talked a little bit about um, locks on the Thames. And I know I have memories of just like learning in school how, you know, there were like so many boats that you could walk across the Thames, right, without like touching the water. Mm -hmm. Um, So how has the kind of intersection of commerce and um, the Thames sort of changed throughout history? So the Thames for a very, very long time until the very recent past. So like the last 50 years or so, it was always a port. It was like a a massive market. Um, The the meeting of like road and river as ever just made it a very popular place for commerce and for a very long time that all happened in the river itself you know boats would come up the river on the high tide anchor or raft up by one of the wharves unload and then go back out again and then in the early 19th century once the industrial revolution had really got underway and london it was really the coal london needed so much coal uh, mostly from coming down from the northeast of england Mm. There just wasn't space for all the ships. So that's mm. when they started digging the docks into the banks of the river, the ones that mm. you can see now where you, there's like a short canal and then the the big basin in it. And yeah, all the way through the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, it was a huge, huge enterprise to the point where there were two major floods in the Thames in the 20th century, one in 1928 and one in 1953. And both times people lost their lives. The second time, hundreds of people lost their lives. Wow. And both times there was a very, you know, strong political, like, yes, something must be done. But the obvious thing to do, which was build a flood barrier, you know, change the banks of the Thames, you know, protect people that way, would have directly impacted on the shipping industry. And so nothing was done because shipping was Capitalism. more important. <laughs> and yeah. mm-hmm. they did the t- there is now a flood barrier in the Thames but it didn't open until the early 80s wow and that was still like I interviewed the guy who's the uh he's like the head engineer on the flood barrier now and he said that I mean they very much saw the building of this as a response to the 1953 flood it just took 30 years and for most of the docks to close during that time right. to get the political will to actually have it built mm. wow so uh, one of my favorite things is to look at a uh, like a place or a thing that has so much, so much history and then kind of see how current generations are telling stories about it. So I would love to hear if there are any like really fascinating urban legends or anything like in more recent years that are like centered around the Thames. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, 
a lot of them do use past history and then sort mm-hmm. of refashion it. Uh, so my favorite thing. <laughs> one of my favorite novels is called Down River uh, mm. by a contemporary novelist called Ian Sinclair. And he's got a character in it who he's like a kind of wandering tramp slash minstrel type person. And Mm. his head is just buzzing with history all the time and he sees it everywhere. And so one second he's sort of looking at the Thames barrier, the sort of shiny, which has got these shiny futuristic piers that look a bit like the points of the Sydney Opera House. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. he's looking at that and he's thinking that it looks like the old stone alcoves on the old medieval London bridge. So he's sort of constantly making the connections. Or um, another story that he's very fond of is there was a major shipping disaster in the Thames in the late 19th century where a pleasure steamer sank and hundreds of people drowned in that horrible mucky sewage. Mm. Um, And one of the people who was, one of the women who was killed by Jack the Ripper uh, a decade or so later claimed to be a survivor of this shipwreck. Um, She actually wasn't. Um, It was just, she just made it up as an explanation for how she ended up, you know, as a sex worker, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But um, she liked the story and like the media liked the story at the time and is like the time since. And he sees her ghost everywhere and he sees her ghost in modern women walking around being near the river. Um, so I always really like that as a kind of interface between the two. Yeah. But there's also just, you know, a lot of very old legends that people still enjoy today. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my favourite ones is the pigs that live in the river fleet absolutely 100 percent not true but um there was this very there is this very persistent urban legend that when they uh closed over the river fleet or the fleet ditch as it was known which was one of the tributaries Mm -hmm. there used to be pigs that were bred by people who lived on the banks of this river and when they closed it in they closed some of the pigs in under pigs and the pigs kind of into bread and became kind of mutant sewer pigs i guess that's and so the, good. They're still down there. And so every so often you get kind of someone saw a sewer pig. Where, <laughs> Listen, I'm that? just saying, so I think the market is there for Teenage Mutant Ninja Pigs. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a spinoff. It's mm-hmm. going to be awesome. It's going to be international. I'm very into it. <laughs> they're a little bit tougher than the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, though, in the kind of sense that like, do you remember Street Sharks? They were very big yeah. and they were, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. All right, good. I do. <laughs> Um, I can I can picture that like very tough pigs. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So yeah, I <laughs> I've always really liked the the sewer pigs. Um, and then there's also just uh, uh, like I was reading about this the other day. There's this persistent idea that you get every so often, uh, resurfacing on blogs that there's a kind of Thames angel, um, Ooh. which various so like one one blog I found has published a lot of investigations into this, and they are convinced that. It, the most famous sighting in 2006 was 100% a hoax done by a charity called Guardian Angels in order to promote themselves. But the okay. charity has huh. never claimed any of the publicity associated with it. So I don't know. But yeah, someone someone thought was on the South Bank and thought they saw an angel flying above the Thames and took a, a photograph in which you can see a kind of white blur, <laughs> which might be reflections from the water or might just be something on the camera lens or it might be a real angel who knows uh who knows and yeah so it it comes up periodically in i've been to a few talks by there's this thing called the london 40 in society which is like a just a society of people who like looking for ufos and that kind of thing Mm -hmm. um my favorite people yeah the the thames angel comes up at their events and stuff like that now does the thames angel do anything or the thames angel is just kind of flying around on the thames just flying around from what i can tell yeah i think people like to think of it as a kind of guardian angel protecting the city protecting the people but i think just flying around okay cool that's it's very interesting i i mean like just the just the idea of an angel occupying the thames is is fascinating on its own even if it's not doing anything besides flying yeah i'm sure there are a ton of like deaths and and crimes associated with that area, both because of the like uh, you know underdevelopment from the city and also just how dangerous like the docks and shipping are. Yeah. So either the angel you know helps keep that number down like lower than it would be, or the angel's just chilling and has more of a laissez-faire like predestination approach. Cool. I also, I also think that if the angel had appeared 
like on Wandsworth Common or something, it would not have persisted in accounts in the same way. Uh, mm. You know, you might have got the same photo photographs, people might have still talked about it, but I just think the Thames Angel just immediately works as a brand name, shall we say. Yeah, um, no, for yeah. sure. Oh man, I love that. I love all the history you've given us, uh, Caroline, and I'm so excited to read the book because of the personal mythology and the, and the personal angle of your growing up and your kind of family's history with the Thames. Um, so how did that like impact you growing up? And how, did you like hate it because your parents loved it? And then you like came to appreciate it later in life? Like, can you give us a little preview of that arc? Yeah, exactly what you just said, actually. That's pretty much it. <laughs> that, um, yeah, I like all teenagers. I, I mean, when I really enjoyed it as a child, I didn't really realize how unusual it was to get to spend all our time sailing and stuff. But once I sort of became a teenager and became a bit more aware that people I went to school with, you know, they went on holidays to beaches. They didn't go to kind mm -hmm. of muddy estuaries and sit on a boat for days on end, <laughs> um, you know, and seasickness didn't feature heavily in their, their holidays where it did in mine. Um, and then, then I became really sort of grumpy and sulky about it and used to moan about it constantly and so on. And then I kind of came out the other side of that, I guess, in my 20s when I really understood how incredibly privileged that was. And also just, I think, once you're a bit more of an adult yourself, you get to understand that your parents are separate people too and are mm. allowed to have their own interests and yeah. you don't necessarily have to share in them. Um, like my sister, for instance, you know, she had the same thing as me, but she didn't really, she hasn't really come back around to it at all. Like she she would happily just not not have anything to do with it anymore. Um, whereas I actually now quite enjoy it and I enjoy hearing about their sailing. I enjoy joining them when I can. And yeah, and I've got really into the Thames and its mythology and stuff. Um, yeah, so I think definitely that that journey from like unawareness to awareness and hating it and then awareness and acceptance let's say is yeah a very big part of the book and at the end of this journey of research or at least culminating in the book i'm sure you'll still be reading and, and researching for a long time to come is there any like predominant emotion or association that you feel now when you do walk over a bridge or, or walk by the side of the thames um i think it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning i just feel it's <laughs> such a cheesy thing to say, but I still feel very much like a student of the whole mm. thing. Um, and just seeing it again for myself just reminds me how much I don't know. Um, so when the, the day that my book came out, my publishers had a launch and beforehand they took me out for a drink on this pub that I'd never been to called the Samuel Peeps, which has this amazing like under like you go into the pub on one level and then you go down some stairs and then there's a balcony that sticks out over the Thames, which oh, I've never, so cool. never been to and it was really cool. Um, and even just that, I was like, oh, wow, I really thought I I knew all of the places where you could get a good view of the Thames and I just don't. Yeah. So yeah, every time I go there, I feel like I, I learn more things that I don't know. The river uh, runs on. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show to tell us all about the Thames and your favorite memories and, and histories of it. Please let everybody know where they can buy a copy of the book and where they can also listen to and read your work online. So the book is called The Way to the Sea and you can buy it. This is slightly frustrating. If you're in Britain, you can buy it at any bookshop. I believe also Ireland and Australia have it in bookshops. But if you're in America, I don't have an American publisher and so it's not distributed physically in the US. You can buy it from UK online retailers, including Amazon, um, and they will ship it to you, but that does cost a bit more. Uh, or you can buy like an ebook version from Amazon and obviously read it. Or I'm sure ask your library to pick up a copy and they yeah. may do so. Yeah, yeah. A very good idea. Um, and then otherwise you can find me at my podcast, She Done It, which is at shedoneitshow.com and generally on Twitter which is C underscore Crampton. Uh, yeah, I think that's all, all the relevant links. She Down It is so good just repeating it for like the 10th time on the show. It's it's fantastic. I listened to the Thames episode yesterday that you did and it just blew me away. Oh, thank you. I, re I really enjoyed doing it. And actually, uh, it didn't occur to me until quite late on that 
that was a good idea, if you know what I mean. Like <laughs> I, I, I kept the terms too close stuff, to you. I kept the terms of so separate. I was like, there's detective fiction, and then there's this other thing I'm working on. I was like, actually, no, these two things overlap in a really interesting way. Murders, mm-hmm. but make it river. I yeah. love it. Just the theme of our show. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, thank you again, Caroline. And listeners, remember, stay creepy, stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors. HoneyBook is offering our listeners 50% off your first year. That's both monthly and annual plans at honeybook.com promo code spirits. Third Love knows there is a great bra out there for every single person with breasts. And you can go to thirdlove.com slash spirits for 15% off your first order. And DoorDash is a very convenient way to get food delivered right to you. Get $5 off your first order of $15 or more by using the promo code spirits in the DoorDash app at checkout. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just $1 gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.